here today in this country and literally in this space because of my tia Lila, who came to the United States as a servant for a uh, rich white Colombian family when she was 20 years old. Um, and over time, uh, despite the fact that this family tried to literally, literally like enslave her and um, not give her access to the papers or the certifications or all of these things that she was promised um, when she decided to come here, she managed to find a way out of that with the help of uh, another Colombian woman that she met and little by little send for the rest of my aunts and eventually for my father. So I share that just because um, I think even for myself, going to Colombia and coming back, a lot of things were confusing because I didn't meet Afro-Colombians here in the US. Um, and it's because it's our condition in Colombia makes it very, very difficult for us to make it out um, me and Ms. Navas talk about all the time how just in 2000, under 0.2% of Afro-Colombian youth were able to graduate from high school, right? Um, I am here because of my family who was able to, my father was never able to actually accompany me to Colombia, but to send me, right? And he, he made that choice because he thought it was very important for me to know early on where I came from. And I think since I was eight, you know, understanding the importance of traveling and the opportunities that it provides you with, how it expands your mind. Um, and since then, I think I've always been extremely passionate and now being able to be in a setting where international education and global education is emphasized, I just, I continue to just understand. And I think we all understand the benefits of it. That doesn't need to be reiterated. Um, I'm also here because of Ms. Navas, who led the initiative to create a Afro-Colombian centered program that allowed Howard University students to travel to Colombia and actually learn about their condition, how race and identity works, um, territorial conflict. So I thank you for that. Um, and more importantly, on behalf of CADUGE, which stands for Colectivo de Afrodescendientes Pro Derechos Humanos, Beco Steven. It's a very long title, but essentially, um, <laughs> it's like the Black Student Union. Um, or Human Rights Collective at Univalle, which is one of the most prestigious public universities in Cali. And um, my friends there, I really am here on behalf of them, my friends who are consistently asking me, we want to go to Howard, we want to go to an HBCU, how can you help us make this happen? And um, being able to study in Cali allowed me to really just connect with you, um, my roommates, really. Um, to give you guys just a bit of statistics, there's a scholar named Aurora Vergara Figueroa, who is from Choco, and she states that 41% of Gali's population is black, but 73% uh, of this population all reside in what's known as Agua Blanca, which is a very racialized region where the rates of illiteracy, unemployment, and homicide are the highest that they are in the city, right? And so, like my friend Armando, who is a senior at Univalle, this prestigious public university just trying to finish, all in this one semester that we meet, he loses his niece, he loses two of his nephews, um, and he's all alone. His mother has been displaced to Chile, and it was just really incredible to see this young black man having all of these things happening to him, grateful to be in this study abroad program that offered him the opportunity to live closer to his university navigate all of this as if it was nothing. And this is the experience of Afro-Colombian youth in Cali because this region is, is kind of like the, the refugee site for all of the Afro-Colombians that are displaced out of the Pacific Coast, which historically, you know, um, even before the armed conflict really, really became, or er, disproportionately affected Afro-Colombian communities, the Pacific Coast has a history of state abandonment. It has a history of a lack of infrastructure. Um, to, I met a woman on the bus in Cali who has to travel three hours every day from Buenaventura to get chemo at uh, one of the best hospitals in Cali because Buenaventura, despite the fact that it is the principal port of Colombia outside of Cartagena, doesn't have um, a hospital where she can get chemo, right? And the same thing goes for people in Choco having to travel hours because they don't what they call nivel tres. It's not, you know, it's, um, it's, an, it's an infirmary, it's a clinic, it isn't a hospital. Um, so I share that with you all just so you guys understand um, the severity of the situation for Afro-Colombians and um, but more importantly how resistant and how resilient uh, I have witnessed these youth be. Um, the Black Student Union that I told you about, they have created what they call Timbuktu 
which is a Saturday school that they run Saturday mornings at 8 a.m. till 12, 1, 4, like depending on the programming that they do. And they offer English classes to community members of all ages. I had students from eight years old to 70 years old. Um, they offer empowerment lectures. I mean, these youth, they also run <coughs> all of these scholarships that black students at this university receive, they distribute that. Black students have to come to their office to you know, get a proper assignment from the president, you know, do all of these formalities so that they can continue their education. Um, and they do all of this out of this little office, this box, um, where they also have a big image of Africa painted on the wall. They have um, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, all of these different international black figures. And um, they are fighting to, or they fought rather to ensure that 8% of the slots at this university could be reserved for Afro-Colombian students. So kind of like a, um, oh, not reparations, mm -hmm. affirmative action sort of plan. Um, at this university, black students are also experiencing some of the highest dropout rates. So I mentioned that just so you all understand, it's not even just a matter of where they're coming from, but once they actually get there, the resources are not put in place for them to be able to stay. So it'll be many, many things that prevent them from being able to finish the education, be it travel time, because most of them are coming from Buenaventura or you know from wherever. Um, not being, I don't wanna say properly educated, because to me, you know, education does not only occur in a classroom, but not having the test scores or, or the rates or the certain understanding that they need, because the place that they're coming from, education is not um, developed and it's not invested in. Um, and I think, like I said, the, the benefits of study abroad and international exchange are very clear. And I'm here today because I want to ensure that in this critical moment, you know, we are in the decade for people of African descent, the international decade, right? Declared by the UN, we're halfway there. It's 2020, um, it was declared in 2014, but began in 2015. There are only four or five years left of that. We're halfway through and there are African descendants all across the world in Colombia who have no idea and how have not been able to reap the benefits um, that the memorandum of understanding that was just signed, Capri, there has been all of these acts, these agreements, and this movement towards wanting to give youth in Colombia and here in the United States, you know, the ability to connect and really um, be recognized for the contributions that African descendants have had all over the world in any nation that you find us. Um, and so I'm here just to ensure that these agreements are materialized, right? And that we can really, really create programs that allow them to be here and spend time here. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. I just wanna make sure that um, you all know that these students, they, they want to come, right? And I think we all have the capability to make this happen as soon as possible, um, so long as we just remember the value and you continue to hear from not just voices like me, but people who can make it make it real, if that makes sense. Um, so I didn't talk too much um, about myself, but I'm a senior at Howard. Um, I lead the Afro-Latin X Cultural Society at Howard University. Um, and I just organize, I do a lot of different things surrounding um, culture, resistance, and scholarship, because I believe that um, culture has been, it's been the number one medium a tool of a resistance or even just declaration for African people across the world. Um, so very thankful to be here today. I can answer any and all questions. Um, yeah. All right, thank you.